He's a great guy, a tireless worker for this organization. In fact, last week, he came up to me and he says, Parker, you signed up a guy. Where's the paperwork? So I gave it to him. Where's the money? I got it in my wallet and took that out. <laughs> so he's always working for us. And not only that, I'm going to read you the first part of this uh, uh, Bible. Uh, he had a very humble beginning. I spent my youth in the small town of Auburn, Indiana. After graduation from Auburn High School, I entered the U.S. Air Force in April of 1957. And after serving my four-year commitment, I was discharged from, the, from active duty in April of 1961. I entered the active reserve at Bearfield Fort Wayne, Indiana, that's B-A-E-R, in 1962 and retired from the reserves in Minneapolis, December 31st, 1992, for a total of 35 years wearing the United States Air Force uniform and serving the needs of my military for my country. The rest of his biography is so great. When I called him up here, I'm going to pass out a few of these at each table so that you can hear the rest of the story. Now let's get this tall, handsome, gray-haired guy up here. Glenn Shaw, front and center, please. You know, guys, I'd rather take a beat than have to talk to you about my, my active duty and reserve service. You guys from uh, the war days, Korea, Vietnam, WW2, and I was in during the Cold War, and I just had fun. I, uh, I want to tell this a little bit different. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me how guys get in the military. Yeah, it's obvious for you guys who got drafted, but. Uh, I come from a small town of 5,000 people. Um, I'm 19 years old, one year out of high school. All my classmates of 65 are scattered all over. Eight of them among the youngs to me are in the military. The rest of my classmates, many of them, went in the college. So I'm home, 19 years old. The streets roll up after 6 o'clock. Only thing is open is the bars. So what am I, I going to do? There's just there's nothing to do but work, come home, and be with the parents. And at 19 years old, I didn't think that was a good idea to be home with my folks. So I come home from work, and I had a good job. I was a gas interviewer for the gas company on a program to advance as I learned my job and vacancies were available. I walk in the house, say hello to mom. The phone rings. I pick it up, and it's Mike Baxter, a high school classmate of mine. He says, come on, Bo. Back home, I'm known as Morris in the middle name. They call me Mo. We're going in the Air Force. We're going to, uh, you and I are going to be together for four years. It's a buddy program. Oh, up until that time, I had never, ever thought about going to the military. It was the farthest from my mind. I didn't have money to go to college at that time. But uh, I said, well, Mike, let me call you back. i got to think about this a little bit. So I asked my mother for her advice. She said, well, you're 19 years old, you're able to make up your own decision, it's up to you. So I thought about it for a minute, I called my employer and he says, I won't be in the office tomorrow, I'm joining the Air Force tonight. So I called back Mike and says, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you at the bus station at 6 o'clock, so he requested. <clears throat> so we jump on the bus, Mike and I, and we go to Indianapolis, Indiana to do our physical. We stay overnight in a pre-designated hotel, but the next day we go to another building, whole bunch of guys, maybe uh, 50, 75 guys to take their physicals. Uh, you know, when you strip down to your shorts and they're poking you and you're bending over and they're doing all the things to you. Mike was right behind me most of the way. But the farther I got down into the line where I'm about done, Mike is not there anymore. I never saw Mike again for six years. Uh, Mike was a rowdy guy. He was a smart guy, excellent football player, tough and rough. But he always hang with the guys in high school a couple years older than him. And they were uh, kind of a bad influence on him. He liked to go to Ohio, which was 10 miles away, and drink a lot of booze. And he was a rowdy guy. So the medics found some problems with him, but he, he eventually got through, I guess. So I get down to, through my physical, they load us up into a train, and they take us down to Lackland Air Force Base. You know, you got to go through the formality of getting your clothes and your blankets, and uh, 
make your bed, and then you got to go to the uh, educational office and take your tests, and you sit and wait. Then they interview you. They call Herman Shaw. They didn't call me bitch yet. They called me Herman Shaw. Uh, it's your turn for your uh, interview. So the interviewer says, well, Herman Shaw, what would you like to do in the military? Well, this is the Air Force. Don't we all fly? I'd like to be a crew member. He says, can you type? And that was the end of it. There's more to it about that later. So I get into my barracks, and the guys are coming in. Pretty soon it's loaded up, and I'm there for about four or five days, and it begins to take, take a personality where you have a bunch of guys from the South, and you have a bunch of guys from New York, and a very few was from the Midwest. It was like mixing the water and oil together. They just not, did not get along. Then at the end of the week, the DI comes over to me and says, Aaron Shaw, yes sir. So I'm gonna get your bag packed, get everything on your foot locker, get in your bag, be at the bus in front of the building, and a half hour, you're going to another barracks. What did I do wrong? She says, nothing. I don't know why you're going. So the bus driver knows where to take me, so they take me quite a ways. And the bus driver says, well, here you are, uh, Aaron Shaw, there's your barracks. Get your stuff and, and get in there. I go in the barracks, and there's nobody there. The phones aren't made up, there's just nobody there. So I hear noise upstairs, and I walk upstairs into an office, and there's God. There's a three-striker there. To us, he was a God. He was a DI, and he said, well, who are you? And I told him, he says, on the list here. You play the trumpet. He says, welcome to the drum and bugle corps. <laughs> oh, this is where you're going to spend the rest of your basic training. So the barracks fills up, and I, I wait, the barracks fills up, and all the guys had music backgrounds. Uh, and after about four or five weeks into it, we are given interviews. Aaron Shaw, you're next, you go take your interview. I sit down, the guy hands me a trumpet, because he knew I played the trumpet, he says, play this music. So I, I did the best I could, and that's the last I heard. And we all did that with our instruments. And that was the extent of drum and bugle corps, that interview. They're looking for people to be in the Air Force bands. None of us made it. And a couple weeks later, we get our assignment where we're going to go, what school we're going to. Mine was tele-type operations. You will have a TS clearance. You're going to Cheyenne, Wyoming. The guys around me were pretty sharp. They were going to language school, really sharp guys. They were going to learn to speak uh, Russian. So at the end of basic training, go ahead, click, yeah. There I am at 19, 160 pounds, six foot tall. That was a box of rocks. But that's my graduation. There's, well, we want to hold her right there. So the day we're supposed to leave, the, um, the guy in charge of the barracks comes to me, the DI, and he says, put this on your sleeve. It's a staff sergeant rank. You're in charge of a two-car train caravan going to Cheyenne, Wyoming. You're in charge. And gives me all the records, big stack of them. Uh, the, air, the train stops in Fort Worth for four hours. And I get other guys around me, and I tell them that, you got to be back here at a certain time. If you're not here, we go without you. Well, the guys all showed up, but they also found the bars, and they found the girls in Fort Worth. They had a good time. So on the shot, we went. Didn't have any problem with the guys. Uh, we get uh, unloaded Cheyenne. We are assigned. There were several career fields involved. My guys were the type people in crypto into one barracks. Uh, we're going through school and we're completing our basic training right there. I spent all my free time uh, in the gymnasium or playing tennis or one of both. In about the, the school was 13 weeks and about the 10th week we get our assignment. They said go check up your bulletin board in the order room. Mine said Korea along with the other guys. There's about 20 of them. I said, oh God, I'm not going to Korea. They're not me. I do not want to go there. I don't know why, I just didn't want to go there. How can I get out of this? So I asked my instructor, you can't get out of it, but sorry, that's where you're going. 
Well, I thought I'm a little smarter than that. I'll, I'll work a deal here. So the following week, we take our tests. I, I say, I'm the only one in the class that fails. Do you think that might be on purpose? So I had to face back two weeks, go another edition of two weeks. And I take the, our assignments are posted again on the French Morocco. Well, who the heck ever heard of French Morocco in 1957? But I thought, well, it's in Africa, so it must be warm. That's for me. I'm going to try it. That'd be a, I'm going to venture. So we graduate. We go home. I was home for nine days in Indiana. Catch a plane to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. That's the airplane we took to Morocco. It's say, what kind of airplane is that? Super G, Connie? Yeah. We stopped in Bermuda and we stay there for 24 hours. Uh, get in Quonset and get to see the island just a little bit. Then we fly into the Azores, largest field, and we stay there for four hours. I think what they did was gas up and refresh the airplane a little bit. Then we land in right outside of Casablanca at Nursur Air Base. <clears throat> we unload there, and most of the guys in the airplane stayed at New Sewer, and then they were bused to surrounding uh, radar sites. Morocco was the front lines at the time of the Cold War. We had lots of B-47s, fighters, F-86s. Uh, we had 100 who were in Tripoli, Libya. A uh, <clears throat> bunch of us get on the bus to go into my base, City Slovenia, Morocco which is about 50 miles away. But on the way, we go through Rabat. We go through Port Leone, the Navy base, which is shared by the French, and my base, the land. And we, uh, I shouldn't say land, we uh, pull into my base, and it's huge. I find out there's 6,000 troops there. We have what we call B-47 reflex squadrons, where the airplanes uh, three men to a crew of a B-47, a squadron would come over, and stay for maybe three weeks. They had to live together. They had to be together full time. They had their own assigned jeep, go to movies, everything together. Then when the siren goes off once in a while, they had to go to the airplane, maybe uh, fly around the flight line. Flight line was huge, very, very wide. It was just tremendously wide. On the back side was the maintenance squadron. Uh, we were assigned huts. This is my squadron, 1975, acres and acres of chickens, you know what? <laughs> Actually, Air and Airways Communication Service. That's the huts we lived in. Uh, normally it's three to four guys per hut, no air conditioning, nothing. That's the guys that uh, I worked with when I was in the comm center for a while. We took the bus to and from. That was wishful thinking when I sold on those stripes. I had one stripe at the time. And that was my home for a year in my hut. I was there probably six hours a day. Most of the time I was gone. Uh, a typical scene in Morocco. Uh, that was taken at the, where they kill, kill the, uh, the camel and they cut it up and they eat, eventually eat the camel. Next please. This is a sheep herder. I had to give him a dime a piece to take the picture. You can see what we over there. This is a, I took it from the Hisson Tower at the Christiansville. That's well, it was Rabat. This is from the uh, the King's uh, the King lived. This is a typical street scene out in the boondocks, uh, out in the uh, farm area. You don't see any cars. It's all camel donkeys. This is Rabat with the wall around the Rabat. Most of the major cities had a wall around it. Built in the, uh, tell you about that. This is the Hassan Tower. Over there for a minute. I got to the top and took some pictures. This was built by, back up a little bit, back in the 16th and 17th century, the Muslims, it was a 99% Muslim country, would go to the Europe in their ships and they'd go into the cities and take what men they wanted to put on the ships as slave ships. They bring them back to Morocco. They had them doing all the work, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ones that North Christians built this, then the Muslims took them to the top and, and threw them off, killed them all. 
and they're the ones that built the uh, walls around the cities. Morocco was famous in those days for uh, going into Europe and getting people prisoners for uh, slave labor. Next one, please. Another uh, wall around, that was probably Marrakesh or Fez or Mignes. That's where the king kept his wives. I think he had something like 35 of them. This is a scene from the countryside. This is typical how the people live. This right over right there. This gentleman right here worked on the base. He was my hut boy. I think I run out of power. He was calling Big Mo. He was my hut boy. We paid him seven dollars a month for each hut. I don't know many, how many huts he had, but that was the way he did his living. Louder, please. Louder. Okay. Is there any way to get this thing to operate? Clemens here.
I learned they had a softball team. So I become the backup pitcher on the softball team the first, for the first season. Then into my about five months, I worked in the, in the comm center. We would work two mids, two swings, and two day shifts, and get three days off. Work six hour shifts. I was offered, because my record said I, I took a water safety instructor course, the local YMCA in my hometown, I was picked. Asked if I would like to volunteer for the assignment for the summer. You'd give me legal duty, give me a lifeguard, and teach kids to swim. And you would uh, have to go through the water safety instructor course at the local pools. So all summer, I pitched basket softball, I was a paper pitcher, and I was a lifeguard. On weekends, I occasionally conducted tours to wherever the guys wanted to go. So I would give a, a bus and a driver. Go up the bus, all guys, where do you want to go, guys? They had no idea. They looked at the me. I said, well, how would you like to go to Casa Bike today, or would you like to go to Fez, or Marrakesh, or Tangiers is too far, uh, or Rabat, tour of Rabat. So the first day we took a tour of Rabat, and we went to the beach. We were on the beach all day, and uh, lots of French girls there. The guys got their hands on some of the French girls. This is uh, the script you're familiar with too, that we used in Morocco. They changed it probably about every six months. And that's a frame. I think it was worth maybe a quarter, I'm not sure of the time. Uh, this is my replacement that I'm about to leave. So you can tell I was outside for quite a bit of time. And uh, about right there. Uh, oh, I tour the base with my motor scooter. I want to see everything. So I'm over parallel to the runway. Here's the seat, uh, the 47s. I'm parallel. He comes down this big. He was going from Texaco as one straight. He was probably in his 40s. So that's very unusual. So anyway, I took a, a ride with it to Tripoli a couple times. We go over to the bank in the back. Then we went up to uh, Gibraltar. It's a broader one than once. This is the west side, I believe. That is somewhat hollow. I think there's a storehouse up there. There's a lot of monkeys in there. That's the uh, east side where you can land. Then while I was there, the tail end of uh, my assignment, I sold my scooter for $200, took the money, and went to the World's Fair. We bought a seat for myself. So, uh, went out to Fort Leone, the Navy base, we jumped on their courier, and took us up to Scotland and Gibraltar, stayed overnight in Red Spain, stayed overnight in Lisbon, we went down to the nicest places, went to a base in England, I was in England for six days, uh, we stayed at a hotel uh, next to Piccadilly Circus for three or four days, for a dollar a night. We went to the Lyceum. We were advised by the guys who went there for us to go to the Lyceum. The Lyceum is the biggest dance hall in the club in England. And I'll tell you, I've never saw such a good girl in my life. We were all there. I met this one gal. I took a tour movie, and that was pretty much the end. But, so, I'm ready to leave. I went to Victoria Station. And I brought the board on the train. And there she is. She just made up her mind she's going to go with me. Well, Arthur, I had to, no, you can't, you can't go. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come back and come back and see that. I'm going to the World's Fair at Brussels, Belgium. So we went up to East Baden, up into Brussels, and I had no idea where I was going to stay. I was pretty much by myself. And I found a boarding house on the streetcar line. I stayed there for the time I was at the World's Fair. But this is the uh, Comia, which is a huge wall that you can get inside and build a house inside of it. The Russian uh, exposition. It was a little uneasy with the Russian exposition, but it was okay. Then I came on back and I didn't know how I was going to get back to my office. So I got the train and went back to East Bud, and lo and behold, there is our C 47 going directly back to my base. It was full of 
people who are on vacation, dependents. On the, while I'm there, I, the pilot would come through, and I told him, hey, I, I was in the airport. Well, Bill, there was an accident that killed him. They served him. The one scrapper was flying the airplane, but four guys in the airplane. And we were blessed the sheep and they had a driver. Killed three of them. And they served him. He said, I'll tell you what, he says, uh, I'm going back to the bathroom. He said, Black people, Black people, sit down. And we made you there. They were there. Well, I don't know if it's not a fault or not. You couldn't move the brain. We were flying right over Paris at the time. <clears throat> so that was a mystery. If I went back, I got it gladly on my phone and said, didn't work. There's a possibility like that. So that was pretty much uh, the end of my year's tour. It's important to have the right frame of mind, to have a positive attitude, to enjoy what you're doing. Uh, I did go back in the comm center to finish the tour. Softball is a big deal there. Uh, it's a big sport. It's the best sport. We, uh, my team went into the finals, and there, when you're playing softball in the championship, boys are reading AFRS and right there in front of us. We lost 7 to 4, still to the final. So on, on the bus, only three of us were going back to, uh, back to the States when I was. So we got on the bus, they take us back to uh, New Sur. Up on our airplane, we are up, up around the problem with the Carolinas on the airplane, flying parallel to the coast. And every one of us, every one of us, cried like Davis to be back in the United States. I, I wanted to stay another year in Morocco, go home, you know, for a, a little leave and come back. But thank heavens I did. Uh, it was nothing like seeing the good old USA. Ernie O'Neill, still awake? <laughs> okay, I go home and my assignment is Osceola, Wisconsin. I'm going to a radar center. Never been to Wisconsin in my life. Didn't have a car. My dad picked me up at a bus station in Fort Wayne. Dad, by the way, I get my car. I owe you money if I go by a car. So, that's the car. Oh, like that. Oh, 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 oh. Just like that. Osceola. All the time I was in Osceola for two days. It's that motor food. That made, the car made me money. I was that. I had a contract with the uh, merchants of Osceola to get the Osceola to the whole grade every Saturday. Yeah, I was a prettiest girl in the senior class. And uh, for all grades, I got $10 a grade. But this is the cycle. I bought this uh, maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, I, when I put my that up for sale, year later, I had three phone calls. All of them were my age group. All of them had to look like I did when they were younger. Their five phone calls were right. So I sold it to a guy in Amarillo, Texas. Sight unseen for only $23,000. Give it away. But what, the reason I sold it because we put it on the lift and it was not a frame off uh, uh, when they repainted it and all the body for it was rusting on the inside. It's eventually going to go through, so I had to get rid of it. This wasn't happening. This is the this is Osceola Air Force Station today. Um, the base was open as a radar site, and how that worked was there's about 250 guys there when I was there to start out. We got down to about 100. Uh, for that. It took 25 years, 1950 1975, and they fed their information into our, the, the radar. It went into the loop at the uh, safe center, and there was a, the right kind of lift that didn't indicate that it was an American airplane. They would scramble the up one of those or in one of six or something like that. Uh, the reason they got down to only 100 guys in the base is because of Radar system kept getting better and getting, getting better, required fewer and fewer people. So, while I'm there, the last year, I was offered an additional duty over and above working in the concert. The lieutenant asked me if I would like to be the club steward. He's the guy in the club steward is in the service. I said, What does that mean? He said, Well, you can let me off this club and you just keep a plane and do 
and all the parties. And the mm -hmm. We'll give you fifty-five dollars a month. Well, that was pretty good when I was only making seventy-eight dollars a month. Then. So I took the job. The downside is you're not with the guys anymore. You're pretty much isolated. You still had your constant job. So while I was there, I pitched in the softball league for two seasons, and I played basketball for us for two seasons. I had a job downtown. Gas station downtown, and I worked for a member of the year. So, when I was also there the last year, the Air Force released a bunch of P 34s to give to various bases to give us one. So, the lieutenant, there was only two of them to be a few, and so he knew how to fly the P 34 and was qualified. So, I go over to him and said, I'll fly the good civics to the world team. That was quite an experience. Who's going to do that? Okay. Uh, while I was there, two guys showed up to paint our radio. This is what they were doing. They were staying in the DOQ, so I got to, got to uh, know the guys a little bit. Here they are on top. You can see. The first time you go on top of that thing, you have to climb this way on the road. Just like this. Clamp in your ladder, and you, you hang from your rope. This is me. The seat of railroad bus, so I was stupid at it. So when I got out of service in April of 61, we were in a slight recession, there were no jobs, nowhere. So I called Baltimore, got a hold of this guy, and he guy's his boss, and they hired me on the spot. He could not get to Baltimore, he was going to put you to work. So I was assigned to a team, that's the hospital from the air. They had actually had four goals. The base is still there, except it's not a base, it's a, uh, it's a retreat center for the Free Lutheran Church. All the buildings are intact. Uh, get back to my job. Uh, I worked in 22 states and four countries in nine months of these grandmas. I came home for Christmas and I went back. I was supposed to do my next assignment after Christmas was going to be. Florida, installing radar equipment. My girlfriend was there from uh, Wisconsin. From my uncle took her to the airport. I got on the airplane with my friend, Craig Baggage. So I got off the airplane. Uh, my girlfriend was trained, sent her back to uh, Wisconsin. And I entered Purdue University Extension before it didn't get. And I found a job also. Then I joined the Air Force Reserve. who helped me. I didn't plan to make the reserves a career, but help me financially, so I got the reserves. And the funny thing is, we were a small enough unit where you could go into the major operations and say, well, I'm due for a promotion. I only got two strikes on it. Well, you're due for another one. I'll write you the orders. It's time to make staff, but you're a staff service strike one. So then we, uh, school, after two years, we moved to I moved to uh, went to Wisconsin State, joined the reserves in Minneapolis. And I was in the concept of air for close to 10 years. I could not get promoted because the guys ahead of me. There were no strikes available. So I, it was an opportunity for me to do base operations because I had prior service. And all the guys in that section of 14 of them were so-called draft guys. They didn't want to go they didn't want to go to Vietnam and so join the reserves. Five of them were awake. <clears throat> the 35 men are out there during the rest of it. was all right. Some of the guys that got out of line, I told them, but keep your mouth shut. Don't embarrass our boss, the major, or me. We'll get you promoted. So they wanted to get so them promoted. I was able to, in 10 years, go to an EAP 8 because there was an EAP slot available. So the promotion couldn't get up there. And I was scared. I couldn't go anywhere. The uh, command chief called a meeting of all NCOs at the NCO club. He told them, there about 75 of us, I guess. He told us that you who get the most professional military education will get the chief slots. Well, I heard that very loud and clear. When the time is right, I got a job in Redmond, I can keep, left my wife and four kids, and went to the senior school academy in St. Louis. I was the first guy from the state of Minnesota to go to the uh, Guard and Reserve. The group 
commander was tickled pink that one of his guys went down to the other head and took the time off and his family his job for eight weeks. He said at the dinner table, congratulations, how would you like to be a chief? And I said, well, now I'll be great. He said, I just have a, a major slot for the major had died. So I'm going to give you that slot. And that was the fourth time up this day as the general manager. I didn't even know they had a slot up. I didn't want to go into the office both because you had to wear your civilian clothes, kind of removed from the military, except for the guys who come to the club. Yeah. So, so six months I was chief. And uh, and uh, when the new uh I remember his name, four star general took over, he made a lot of changes in the first and third thing that he would change the uniform for the office. Maybe they didn't like the airline buttons. And uh My term was done in September of 92 because they eliminated all military from the clubs except for isolated troops. So I had to retire a big deal for 35 years in politics. When you're a chief, there's no place for you to go. So, you to go to the end so that pretty much quit my military career. But since 92, I've been probably more active in military things, veterans things. I never was an active duty. I didn't tell you a lot about what I did in my job because, like that picture I took of the uh, town center, that was on the midnight shift. Had I got caught a fight in court one day, they'd be thrown in jail. You know, that stuff there, it's all obsolete now, so it's all damn. That's into my story, guys. Uh, you got any uh, questions? Okay. Yeah, sir. Sure. Between the Murdoch and the Cabot and Bobby, what is snow like? Good question. The air, <laughs> the air always had a strange odor. I, I thought it was charcoal. Yeah, I thought that's what they were making. But it always had a strange odor. But another incident we had was this recent day. B 47 was coming in for landing. The landing gear collapsed. It caused corrosive sparks. I didn't see it happen. But the sky all of a sudden is black. And we evacuated the base. We didn't know how far go. The guys were able to get out of the airplane, all three of them. I saw the airplane across the field after it had burned up. It was just a skeleton. It was not pretty. It was the only accident I saw. The base uh, closed and they talked to a pilot who flew the B 47, so last one out. And he said, when the airplanes left, the base were flying over. Everybody, all the Americans left Morocco in 1965. And we don't I could guess, because the B 52 was coming on strong, and it had long range, and it had better, had PC 135s coming on strong, mm -hmm. so they could fly at much longer range. I would think if you're a B 47 and you're going into Russia, it's a one way street. I got a question there. Sir. You had one picture up there where he had the feet up on the bed. Yes. It's like he had white socks on. I did. Did you I have special permission for that? I was on third shift. We didn't have any offices around. <laughs> <laughs> no offices. Silly question. Why did you wear your wristwatch on your right? Because I'm left handed. Okay. And uh, the action is over here. What you wish you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they. He is a remarkable man. His career, if you read it, it's phenomenal. Let's give him a big hand.